Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for another CIQ webinar. My name is Zane Hamilton. I'm the Vice President of Solutions Engineering here at CIQ. At CIQ, we're focused on empowering, <clears throat> sorry, let's joke, the next generation of software infrastructure, le leveraging the capabilities of cloud, hyperscale, and HPC. From research to the enterprise, our customers rely on us for the ultimate Rocky Linux, Werewolf, Aptainer support escalation. We provide deep development capabilities and solutions, all delivered with a collaborative spirit of open source. Today, we're gonna to be talking about chat GPT. I think this is something that's been all over the internet all week, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. We have some very passionate individuals on this topic. So if we could bring everybody in, that would be great. Just as I choked, Justin, I mean, we talked about this all week and I, I literally, what, second sentence in, so. You, you're getting all emotional, man. I am, I'm getting very emotional. So let's go around to inter introductions. Justin, I'll start with you since I've already called you out. Just as you yeah, of course. <laughs> right. Uh, my name is Justin Burdine. I work with Zane here at, uh, on our uh, solutions engineering team. Um, and so I'm really excited to kind of get here and talk with these guys who are much smarter about this than I am, uh, especially from an HPC perspective. Uh, so I think the role I'm playing today is kind of the layman, uh, layman's understanding of, of kind of what this thing does and, and the potential that it can do. So definitely excited to hear their perspective. That's great. Mr. Godlove, going backwards today. You surprise me. I did. Hey, um, my, name, my name is Dave Godlove. I have a background as a, a neuroscientist and a primary research scientist at the National Institutes of Health. I've been around the uh, high performance computing container um, uh, ecosystem sphere, whatever the community for quite some time. And um, I've helped to develop Singularity and also Aptainer. And so now I'm a solutions architect working at CIQ. Thank you, Dave. Jonathan, it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Jonathan Anderson, uh, background in HPC sysadmin and related things, and I'm with the Solutions Architect team here at CIQ. Thank you. And Forrest. Nope, audio. Rut row. Unplug, plug back in. I've been doing that to him all week. I'm on. There we go. Is there any... Echo, a little bit. It's like not not too bad. He's got the, that second chance. He's got the uh, second window open. He's going to do some sharing from there. So I bet that's yeah. getting some feedback. We'll work through it. Yeah. Okay, I may have to redo that because I can't mute only one tab of the site. If I've got two tabs of a site open, it mutes <laughs> both tabs of them on that site. So I, we might have to. Yeah, hold on. We'll figure it out in just a second. My name is Forrest right, well, let's go ahead. There I'm you an go. HPC systems engineer here at CIQ. I uh, work on the solutions architect team with Jonathan and Dave, and uh, I am very excited to discuss ChatGPT and its broader implications for HPC. So I know this is something that Forrest, I think you and all of us have talked about quite a bit recently. I know you're very passionate about this. Uh, I didn't know anything about it until you started talking about it, and then I went and started playing with it, and it is mind-blowing. So why don't you explain to everyone what ChatGPT is? So yeah, so ChatGPT is a large language model uh, based on text generation that has been developed by OpenAI. Um, you've probably heard of OpenAI in the media before. Uh, it is the same company that put out the Dolly and Dolly 2 uh, text to image generation models that kind of uh, over the past kind of six to eight months or so have kicked off a lot of the you know massive public interest in AI. Um, for a really long time, you know, uh, algorithms, content, ad serving, tracking, all that stuff has been done, you know, to an extent, algorithmically via AI, you know, those type of things. Um, so there's been a lot of these little brains that have been kind of, you know, deciding things for a long time behind the scenes that many people may have not, you know, may not have been aware of. Um, you know, even like fraud detection systems and things like this for transactions. There's a lot of kind of back end AI that people aren't aware exists out there. Um, kind of over the last six to eight months, we've seen kind of revolution where there's been some very forward, public facing, um, very obvious uses of AI that have become very, very popular. Um, one of the first ones was the text image generation stuff that came out with Dolly 2. Like I said, that's open AI. Um, they're, you know, uh, draw me a portrait of a cat in the style of Vincent Van Gogh, that type of thing. Um, that was huge. Uh, that came out as a beta research preview. Um, so that was really big. Then it became, uh, you know, publicly available, and you know, then everyone got a hold of it. 
then there was a, a open source text image generation model called Stable Diffusion that came out that really shook things up because uh, at that point with it being open source, people can build it into all kinds of other things. So that, you know, just here in the last three or four months um, has made things even crazier. And now um, we've kind of seen another side of this from the text to image generation models and perhaps a more, uh, as we see, powerful um, and uh, much broader in scope uh, in terms of the capability that uh, you have with these newer ones, these text generation ones, as opposed to just the text image generation ones. Uh, so back to your original question, Zane, what is open or what is uh, chat GPT? Like I said, it's a large language model developed by OpenAI um, that's been trained on a huge amount of textual content. As I said, text image generation has been around, you know, six to eight months. This is the first time kind of with this AI revolution going on that we've seen something that generates text like this come out. Um, it's highly advanced. It turns out that um, text ends up encompassing a lot of things. Um, essentially, anything that has some type of uh, textual-based data encoding can be hypothetically expanded upon by ChatGPT. Um, I saw someone somewhere describe this basically as anything with a grammar, essentially an organized uh, textual way of structuring information. Uh, it can do at least some level of generation for. Um, it's not, you know, obviously not conscious, not intelligent, anything like that. It's just, you know, at best, um, a massive facsimile of a, you know, the, um, you know, writing component of a consciousness that um, can, with a very high accuracy, reproduce what you expect it to say when you ask it something. So it's not always 100% accurate. Um, it can get, it can, you know, like I said, textual-based encoding goes really, really far. Um, I've seen people be able to uh, generate simple melodies and music that are compositionally, like musically correct with this. Um, I've seen people generate code with it. I've seen people generate all kinds of different things with it. Um, ultimately, like I said, depending upon how it's prompted, you can kind of sometimes get it to more obviously produce incorrect output than others. Um, but in a lot of cases, uh, you know, to an expert in the field, it can get you, you know, 85 uh, with some simple things, you know, 85 or so percent there. Um, so it's not perfect. It definitely takes, you know, somebody, I heard someone call it, you know, a Dunning-Kruger simulator um, because it's very capable of convincing you that it knows something about a lot of different things. When in fact, if you're not an expert in it, you know, you might not be able to tell the minutia that it's missing. So ultimately in the end, it's this massive language model that's really, really good at saying what you expect it to say. And while that tends to be accurate ultimately because the information it's been trained on is by and large accurate, it doesn't always put things together in the correct ways. Um, so regardless, incredible technology, um, what it can already do is pretty mind blowing. Uh, so, you know, we've been thinking, you know, the obvious six to 12 months out, what's this gonna do? Um, yeah, that was a very long winded way to say it's a large language model that's very capable of producing incredibly interesting and intricate output that is sometimes correct, but is correct enough of the time for it to be a useful tool to people very broadly in a lot of different fields. So, no, that's yeah. that's great. And I, I, Justin and I like to keep lists of things that we predict are going to happen. So I have a list going now of things from this that I predict. So I'd love to hear from you guys who are watching this. What do you predict is going to come out of this? And then at the end, I'm going to ask everyone else on this to give me their predictions as well. And don't I will write them down and we'll go back in a year and talk about it. So from Jonathan, from you and, and Dr. Godlove's points of view, how does this impact HPC and how does HPC impact something like ChatGPT? And I'll start with you, Dave. Yeah, great question. So um, so how does how does HPC impact ChatGPC is what I'll what I'll begin with. I mean, HPC is, is really integral. I mean, HPC very very broadly speaking is um integral to this type of technology right i mean um the you know many folks who are are, are using um ai uh might not actually classify this as high performance computing as such but when you're taking you know giant pools of computing resources and linking them together um including gpus or including um you know tpus or whatever it is that it might be and you're pulling those those together and you're using those to train models i mean that that in my mind is is 
you know, what HPC is all about. And I think a lot of people on this panel have talked before about how AI really, you know, uh, is uh, created by HPC. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as like tr training the models to be able to do this, as far as, you know, actually using the trained models to, uh, cr you know, generate this, this language and, you know, generate the, the pictures and the things that Forrest was talking about earlier. I mean, that's all, it, it's pretty clear how like HPC is integral to that. I, I think another, another interesting question is that we can start to ask now is how is AI going to impact HPC? Um, you know, and that's, that's a question which is a lot more, a lot less well-defined at, at present and a lot more interesting. Uh, a few days ago, one of the things that, so, so Forrest kind of touched on this, and I'd like to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Maybe, I don't know if we go on this tangent right now, but I'll, I'll maybe like at least poke at it a little bit. Um, Forrest talked about how uh, text is a really, you know, broad category of data, right? There's lots of different data which can be encoded as text, including code. And so that's one of the things that um, I've been playing around with with ChatGPT a little bit uh, is, you know, I, I need a little function for something I'm writing. And I, I could, you know, it, it, coders usually know that it's a lot easier to take some code usually, which is existing and modify it to do what you need it to do rather than to, you know, start from scratch and write everything up. So I've been playing a little bit with just asking ChatGPT, hey, you know, in such and such language, create for me a function which does X and then turn it loose and it, you know, spits something out and it might not be exactly what I'm looking for, but I can copy and paste that into to an editor and I can start working on it. And pretty soon I've got something running. Um, I asked it the other day to just on a lark, uh, create a Slurm submission script for um, a MPI job running charm. And it, you know, it created, it, it made some assumptions about, it was pretty cool because it made some assumptions about, um, specific uh partitions which existed on the cluster and so forth and and resources that it had available to it but with those assumptions it created uh semantically um acceptable uh, uh definition or a uh, submission script for slurm so you could grab that and you could say well i don't have this partition on my on my cluster but i've got another one that i can use and you could have changed some of the uh values and you could you know as a new person using a cluster, you could very quickly get up and running. And then my personal um, favorite so far is, uh, you know, I, I have a little pet peeve or not really a pet peeve, but I guess uh, coding weakness that I never really sat down and um, did the work to really learn about. I mean, I, I know about them, but I've never really learned the semantics for um, regular expressions. And, you know, they irk me because they're slightly different in every language. And there's just little, you know, so regular expressions are something that, that bother me. So the other day that I was dealing with one, I was like, let me just plop this into chat GPT. And it explained for me piece by piece, every little bit of the regular expression. And then I said, oh, okay, well, that's not exactly the one I need. Generate for me instead one that does this. And it said, okay. And it spat one out for me. And it was, it was a passable regular expression. So, um, did it work? As far as said, yeah, as far as said, it, they're, it's not always exactly right, but when you're dealing with something like um, a function that you can test, like, you know, this does or does not load the file in the way that, in which I've asked you to do it, uh, it's perfectly acceptable at that point to say, hey, generate for me this thing that's supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, as long as you go test it and make sure it actually does X, Y, and Z after you get the, after you get the function written, then um, that's, that's, a great, that's a great way in which... Uh, this technology is going to accelerate, I think, high-performance computing and, you know, software development in general. That's, that's interesting, David. I want to come back to some of that in a minute, but I want to give Jonathan an opportunity to weigh in on his thoughts on this, how is it going to impact HPC and vice versa? So, yeah, well, well I, I wrote down some thoughts here. So that the... <sighs> I've been trying to figure out how to classify the usefulness of this as a tool. And, and that, that was my first big uh, perspective shift. Every time I've heard about things like this, they've seemed like a novelty to me. And this was the first time that it felt capable enough that I legitimately found myself reaching to it as a tool. Um, so that, that I think is, is pretty cool. And I think the best way I've found to describe that so far is it's a really good rubber duck debugging uh, kind of pair programming thing. If you're having a problem 
and you want to like I could explain it to this ball on my desk and it would be a certain level of value. And I think working through a problem with a model like chat GPT uh, will probably be a better experience than that, that kind of old adage of just talking through a problem helps you solve it. Um, I'm really interested to see what happens in the space of custom training, all of the, uh, uh, all of the kind of notoriety in the news has just been off this generic kind of general knowledge trained set. Uh, but one of the things, as I understand it, that OpenAI in particular is offering is to retrain their model based on your domain specific information. And I'm really interested to see what that experience is like and how much of, of information from your specific domain you need to be able to provide for it to uh, produce interesting results. And so if I think about it in the context of other kind of machine learning, uh, what we've traditionally seen like image, uh, image categorization, uh, right? And you, you, can, uh, you can have a model similar to this, go through a bunch of images and categorize them for what's in the images. Uh, I'm interested to see what happens if you can feed a bunch of domain specific information that's uncategorized, unsorted, not really well understood into a model like this and then have a conversation with it to learn things about the data that's in there and, and start a research process through a conversational discovery as though you're having a conversation with someone that's gone and read all the books on the topic. Uh, so I think that would be cool. Uh, there's also been some news in the past, specifically around code generation with, uh, is it GitHub? Um, what is that thing called? The, GitHub has a code Co generation bot. Hmm? Copilot. Yeah, Copilot. Mm -hmm. And probably just because I don't have a habit of using a code IDE, I never really got into that. But I actually, more than the chat GPT interface, I use the, the OpenAI Playground interface that's more obviously like a text prediction thing instead of having a conversation. You can start some text and then hit enter and it will try to continue what you've done. And so you can do code generation with that really simply by writing a comment it's like this function does this and then enter and it spits a, a, a function out at you and uh I, i've found myself doing that kind of thing um and i, I don't remember if i said this yet but uh one of the guys on the team rec or, uh, referenced it as like having a junior developer at your beck and call at all times but there's there's negatives to that so i i don't know golang very well uh, it's new to me here at CIQ and I've been coming up to speed with it, uh, through, you know, interfacing with our own products and the communities that we, that we support. And I wanted to do something in a werewolf template with a Golang template. And I thought about with the information that I have about how Golang works, I thought about how that should look. And I tried it the way I thought would make sense and it did not work. And I spit out an error and I was spent a while Googling and I thought, you know what? I'll ask uh, GPT uh, how to do this. And I wrote this, I, wrote, I, I looked up the syntax for a Golang template comment and I wrote a comment at the top. It's like, this Golang template does this and hit enter. And it basically spit out exactly the same code that I had written myself that doesn't work. And I thought that was really interesting that uh, we kind of both had the same process of understanding how the language works and what would make sense to work and then tried it. Uh, but it didn't get me new information. And that's where I think what Dave said, that it's really best used by an expert who needs kind of pointers to things rather than trusting the answers it generates. And, and I think that that level of brainstorming and getting you to think outside of the box is what it'll be really good at, at least in the near term. So I think that's really interesting. And I feel like we've all tried this from a code perspective. I know Justin and I, you, we've had this conversation about it gets you some percentage of the way there. And I think you would phrase it a little bit differently than, than what I had, um, but using it as a place to get an idea. But before I ask you that question, Forrest, you've done this and you've tried it with some different scripting languages, I think. Jonathan, you tried it with Go. Dave, you did it with Slurm. Justin, I know you did this and asked it to write an Ansible playbook. I asked it to write some C for Arduino and it it all turned out actually pretty good. So it's. It's interesting the broad amounts of code that it can do. But Justin, you and I have been talking about it and looking at it from a from a truly from a, uh, a writing and a speaking perspective of I'm having trouble with an idea, and then I'll let you tell the rest of that story. Yeah, I, I think it's well. I think the statement to start with is 
it's really good at generating that spark of an idea. If you're sitting in a blank page going, I have no idea what to write, just start talking to this thing and it will come up with responses that you can then take. I mean, I think everybody said that, you know, it gives you that point of generation. Certainly it's not something you want to actually put out there uh, as, a, as a final product, but it does a pretty darn good job. I did see a funny quote uh, this last week as people were reacting to this thing and, and somebody said, uh, it's the world's greatest BS artist. Meaning it's like, if it doesn't know something, it'll be really convincing at telling you like the, the that whatever it's telling you is really is really the right answer. So I think right now um, it's it's really a great tool, like I said, for getting that original idea. Um, and, and I think the anecdote you're wanting me to talk about is is uh, I had spent with my Arduino projects about a, a full weekend trying to come up with how I could do some controlling of a of a of a monitor. And I had to look up some of these really obscure things. Um, and it took me all weekend and finally got it working. Well, Zane was doing the same kind of thing, but with stepper motors in the Arduino. And he asked it, hey, can you write me this code that will, that will control these stepper motors and have a web server and have the web server control it? And it wrote the code. And I think it, what, it missed like three little header files. But other than that, it yeah. worked just fine. So I think it's pretty fantastic. I think it's going to be, you know, I don't see it. I don't think it's as doom and gloom as, as the headlines will say, if, you, if you're asking me kind of from that perspective. Um, I, I do think that, you know, it's, it's certainly going to be the next thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm very curious to see where that, where it ends up. It's fantastic. And we're having a lot of questions and comments put in here. Uh, thank you for all of the interaction. All right. The open, I play, uh, open AI playground is fantastic for ad hoc functions. Uh, function generation it can also be greatly uh, generate conveniently meaningful text for a birthday card ah interesting I hadn't thought about that yeah oh I mean, mr devonis is giving us some great said comments here with a little bit of uh too many daves <laughs> love it um I all right to sorry for it um yeah some of the stuff that i've seen like i said with scripting languages and stuff like that um <clears throat> you know like all of us i'm trying to use this to you know automate components of, you know, what I do and things like that and to see what, uh, you know, the capabilities of it are, as we touched on, um, you know, writing Go and, uh, you know, writing Slurm files and stuff like that. I've been looking at it from a container perspective and kind of giving it a, uh, you know, kind of trying to figure out what exactly it can do around, as you, you noted there, Zane, like scripting languages and uh, things like that as well. Um, so some of the interesting results I've seen so far is like asking it to produce um, you know, a container file for, uh, you know, a container that has GPU enabled PyTorch in it, um, you know, on NVIDIA GPUs or something like that. And this was like the first thing that I ever asked it for is, you know, you know write me. Um, it has a very, uh, uh, the, mem the cutoff of the information that it knows is like the end of 2021, around September or so. So it doesn't know about certain things. So it doesn't know, for example, about like the singularity and container switch over. Um, so for example, you know, one thing I asked it was, you know, write me a singularity container file for, um, you know, GPU enabled PyTorch, uh, for, you know, NVIDIA GPU enabled PyTorch. Um, I had to go lie down for a moment when it spat out a file that was like, wow, this is, um, this is pretty close to how I would do this in the end. That's not precisely how I would install, you know, the CUDA toolkit or, you know, that, but it's a way that I'm pretty sure is going to work. And I was able to take that with a couple modifications, you know, end up with it working and building. And I'm like, wow, that is really incredible that, you know, it can, it knows enough about, you know, container syntax to actually, you know, give like a post section and, you know, bootstrap and all that stuff. Um, some of the other stuff that I've gave it, like, for example, it's very interesting what it's like. Um, uh, it's very interesting how it can be kind of non-deterministic and how it can almost have it's interesting, like how you can mine results out of it. Um, you know, I asked it, write me a diffusion based uh, text to image AI generation model in or based on PyTorch. Uh, and it first off said, oh, I'm just a large language model built by OpenAI. I can't do that. So I reset the thread and put the same request back in. And lo and behold, oh, here's your diffusion based text to image AI model written in PyTorch and gave me like 50 lines, 60 lines worth of code for it. Um, I was like, wow, that is very, very impressive. That is, so it's interesting how it can be non-deterministic. And sometimes, you know, I've seen people, um, you know, kind of like, oh, well, you know, I think a large language model should be able to do that. So give it a try. Um, so it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, 
the problem space that it understands is not absolute and it can be non-deterministic in what it actually ends up resulting. It can do really, really odd stuff like simulate a Linux terminal because ultimately a Linux terminal is just a text-based interface. So you can encode all of that information in such a way that it can understand it. So somebody out there figured out like the magic paragraph to give it that basically gives you like a Linux terminal prompt. Um, and so I was taking that and putting in uh, like bash vulnerabilities into it. And so I found that like you can give it, you know, a fork bomb and it'll basically say, uh, you know, terminated, like as if it's it's got rid of it before it could explode and halt the system. Um, you can also give it like, for example, one of the initial shell shock CVEs and it will say that the system, it will actually print and say the system is vulnerable. But it'd give it one of the later ways to test like two of the different shell shock CVEs it will give you an output that indicates a patched system. So it's been interesting to me to see that like, you know, this initial command, when it's been, you know, um, when this command is posted on the internet, it seems like most often its results are associated with like what a, what's printed for a vulnerable system. And that's what OpenAI gives you. If you run this other command that it seems like, you know, is mostly associated with getting like a patched result. Like if you go look at the Wikipedia page for these, that's like the result that it shows outputting from them. You get, you know, from this other one, an indication of a patch system. So it's not absolute. You can definitely find the kind of poke holes and how it knows things. And you can definitely find different ways that it, um, that it is not actually thinking about things, but is just kind of mimicking what it's seen out there. So you can tell, you know, that for all the intelligence it might appear to have with some of these things that there are still, you know, odd spots in the problem space where it's not really doing what it seems like it's doing. It's just a very, very convincing fast model. You can also get it to play Zork to an extent. Um, but one thing that's very different about OpenAI versus these other models is uh, that it has a concept of memory. There have been, you know, other chatbot AIs in the past. I, I don't, I don't find it accurate to classify this as a chatbot because it's not just that there's a lot more that it can do than just, I mean, this is not 2011 and this is not, you know, Cleverbot or something like that. Um, I, I may have lost my train of thought in saying that, but um, uh, I was addressing one of the questions that we had along the way. Oh, yeah. How does ChatGPT improve on traditional chatbot technology? Um, it, like I said, it actually has a concept of memory. So you can actually refer to prior things in the conversation and it'll be able to, you know, continue to expand upon them. You can, you know, kind of say, you know, so what about, you know, for example, I was able to ask it, uh, I just fed it in a container file, like 50 or 60 lines long that I had written. And it gave me a whole analysis of like, this is what this container file is doing at each step. It's probably installing this. It's probably installing that. And then I asked it, does this uh, container file appear to be GPU enabled? And without having to respecify the container file, it just knows that I'm talking about this should be prior part of the conversation. So one big unique thing about it is that it has this concept of memory. And I may have had an original point that I was trying to link that back to, but it's very good to note that one of the biggest differences is it has a concept of memory. And it, uh, um, for all the mimicking that it's doing, it can still expand upon itself in the context of one conversation. So it's uh, it's very interesting. It's, it's, it is simultaneously extremely powerful, but you know, in the context of one conversation, you can get it to show you a vulnerable system and a patched system for, you know, the same CVEs. So it's it's interesting to find kind of the odd holes in its capability. You can like, when it gives you the Zork output, there's actually a serial number on that like Zork output. So if you, you know, to find whereabouts out there, that serial number is, you can start to fingerprint, you know, data sets and things like that. But I'm, I'm concerned. I, I'll stop talking lest open AI is listening we, and not pleased listening. with the of course. The research. My of course. <laughs> of course. So we have <laughs> several comments coming in. I know Andre has a good one. Uh, I was wondering if I think you could speak a little bit about the potential impact of ChatGPT on the job market. And I think Boris, Justin, I know we've talked about this quite mm -hmm. a bit. And uh, as Dave mentioned, it's currently close to a junior developer. Uh, and that's just in preview. So I'm going to go back to Dave since you started this topic. What do you think the potential is? Yeah, I mean, um, th this is uh, it, this is not a, a topic of discussion which is unique to this particular technology, right? Um, there was a, a big piece that came out uh, recently, I believe, in the Atlantic that was asking if ChatGPT was going to kill the college essay, 
um, you know, because now you're basically just handing all your uh, prospective college students a way to uh, plagiarize their entire essays, and you're making it much, much more difficult for the software that detects that plagiarism to actually figure out that you've done it. Um, you, you know, I, I, to me, I can only answer this question in terms of other types of technology. You know, really, anytime anything new comes out, there is a fear that it's going to um, it's going to make, uh, you know, one group of workers obsolete and it's going to put a bunch of people out of work. Um, but what you find is that the new technology typically enables new types of work that were previously unimaginable. And so, and then those new types of work, you know, create a bunch of jobs and open up a bunch of new things and, and so on. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't think you know, it, it could, it might be the case that this type of technology ultimately ends up displacing a lot of people. But I think it's, it's also, it, it's just going to change society, right? In the ways that lots of different technologies change society, and it's going to end up creating, um, you know, new jobs as well, moving people from one place to another. And I can't, I don't know what that's going to look like yet. But you know, I, my, 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 my um, feeling is that that's probably what would happen. So as you're saying this, and I'm thinking about Andre's question, to get really good at something, you have to either do it a lot or go to training or go to training and then do it a lot, right? So to become even a junior admin, there's a lot of effort in that. You have to do a lot of things. You have to try to fail and repeat and try. And How could this actually help make that progression faster? Like taking you from a junior admin to or a junior developer to a more senior developer because you can get the examples that you need very quickly so that you're actually learning the right way or you're learning in a way that actually works instead of having to go hack around on the internet for like Justin and I were doing for weeks to find something simple to do, I can do it in minutes. So maybe, does it help? Oh, well, I think so. I mean, I think, I think one of the cool things um, about it is that you can have it explain things. I think uh, Dave's, Dave's admission of, uh, of uh, struggling with uh, regular expressions. I mean, like put something in there, explain this to me, uh, having that at your fingertips and being able to get something that's written uh, I even saw some the other day starting to prompt, you know, explain it to me as if I'm a five-year-old. So they take this big complicated output and they go, okay, great. That's awesome. Explain it as if, as if I'm five. And, you know, when that thing can just spit out the same information, but much more digested so that people can learn at that level, it just gives them, I think, a much faster ramp up because um, you're not having to necessarily start from the ground up and build on those um, I think there certainly undercuts a deeper understanding, but I think the advantages of having this, um, you know, it's just new and different. And I think there will be, uh, there'll be fears out there of, of, of all sorts of things, but I think it's, it's definitely, um, certainly interesting. So. That's great. I'm trying to read that to the comments. Perfect. Uh, so Dave asks, do you think OpenAI will ever sell a dedicated chat GPT appliance uh, that will come with a massive training set of data? Uh, and have continuous upgrades. They have a federal customer who would, who likes such things as on-prem appliances. I think this kind of goes back to what Jonathan was talking about with the offerings around retraining that OpenAI has. Um, I think OpenAI is probably going to be pretty tight-fisted of any of their model code or anything like that that people could potentially you know hack out of an appliance or something like that and go try to put elsewhere. Um, and I, you know, granted that'd be pretty bold, but the level of sophistication that it already reaches with the training that it has is more than likely going to be augmented, um, like as Jonathan said, most effectively as related to commercial business um, with the code bases and documentation sets. Um, who knows, maybe even, uh, you know, who knows, copies of message boards or stuff like that, that uh, places I anticipate will retrain uh, OpenAI on. You can already... Um, pay them to retrain some of the other models that they have, like GPT-3, on custom data sets that you have. And then uh, it is capable then of generating uh, custom responses based on what's been retrained on. Um, ChatGPT at the moment is just a research preview, so obviously there's nothing like that. Um, I think as far as an appliance goes, mostly this is just an inference task. Um, and I think in the end, less so than like a physical appliance, they'll probably end up offering this as some type of like what they already have existing, like a software as a service model, um, where you give them basically your data sets, they retrain it and you end up getting served out 
uh, some type of portal to a custom version of it that's been retrained. Um, so whether or not that covers you know, the on-prem appliance, because obviously, you know, if we're trying to do this air gapped or somewhere, you know, as you know, if they're in a federal environment, you know, software as a service model might not work. Um, so I envision that uh, if the demand becomes high enough, they will probably try to find a way to um, lock down something like that and provide that type of air gapped access. Um, but for the moment, I anticipate they will probably be looking mostly at their existing well-established software as a service model for that type of thing. But I continuous hunting, just a note on that as well, because there is there is value to that because it doesn't have a dynamic way at the moment to like learn new information. So it can't go out and like learn about things it doesn't know about at the moment. So like it doesn't, it can't tell you specific things about, you know, certain people or, you know, uh, you know, large figures in tech or celebrities, whatever. It has no dynamic ability to relearn from the internet or even search the internet at the moment. Um, so continuous updates will somehow be a way that they'll have to serve that out. I envision on their side, they probably have the architecture to do that type of retraining effectively to continually um, reintegrate the latest in current events and the latest in you know science and things like that. You know, we just had, you know, we just achieved nuclear fusion and things like that. So there are things that chat GPT needs to know about. Um, and so continuous updates, I imagine that will be a part of it as well. I'm not sure how they would do that in an on-prem environment. I imagine they'll probably have solutions people to work that out um, in those type of specific air gapped ones. Um, but for the moment, I imagine like the continuous updating once this becomes a, a publicly available thing that you're paying for will be something they handle on their side. Sure. So Tronix has a question that the one we're going, yeah. So what does gen uh, generative pre-training and gener Go ahead, Dave. Um, I asked the chat bot that, that question because I didn't know either. Uh, it, I'll just read it to you. It says the term uh, generative pre-trained transformer or GPT refers to a type of artificial intelligence model that uses unsuper blah, 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 blah. Uh, it means that the model has been trained on a large data set of text. So the, 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 uh, the generative part of the term uh, refers to the model's ability to generate new text. It's just generating stuff. And while the pre-trained obviously means that it's been pre-trained on, an, on, a, on a, a data set already. Um, you had another question too, uh, Tron, Tron W, um, that I thought maybe we could uh, address a little bit. So, so um, you're, you're asking about the parameters of the model. Um, so... I'm actually unsure if this is a neural, if this is a, a deep learning, uh, deep neural network model. I don't know, um, Forrest, if you might know that already, if this is a, a deep learning model. Uh, I assume it is because most of the, like the cutting edge, really, you know, crazy intelligent AI these days is just, um, you know, deep neural networks or deep learning models. And so in the, in the, uh, the context of these know that the, the, the words themselves or the phrases or the, the, the training data would not be the parameters. The parameters would be things like, um, so these, these neural network models, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks have talked about them a lot and I'm by, by no means an expert, uh, as far as the software goes, but, uh, from like, so, so, so basically there are these arrays that they have. And each one of those arrays is one of the, like the, 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 um, the layers of the neural networks. And so these are each one of these arrays is connected then by like, like point to point connections, which go from one point in one array to all the different points of another array. And like the, the major parameters are things like the strength of those connections. So what ends up happening is you give input to like one point of one, um, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in the array. And I, I think the easiest way to explain this is like in the visual, uh, in the visual um, models. So you got a lot of models of these type will recognize objects. And what that is, is you end up with like, you can think of a picture as a bunch of different points, right? They're, they're pixels. And each one of those pixels has like luminance values. Maybe they have individual black and white luminance values, or maybe they have three luminance values, one for R, B, and G, red, green, and blue, right? And each one of those ends up being input to like one point within the input layer of the model. And then that one point then projects to uh, areas of the next, you know, points within the next layer of the model. And the fact that you've got multiples of these 
makes them deep. What you do during training is you adjust the strength of, uh, you know, how much does one point drive another point deeper in the model and how much does that point drive the activation of other points. And so that's what's actually being adjusted during training. And then what you end up with is this, this network, this, um, you know, of all these different layers, and sometimes they can be very complicated uh, in, in how the layers interact with one, one another. But at the end, you end up with all these, um, these weights, which are the, uh, you know, one, you know, the, the parameters within the model, which have all been trained. Um, and then you can just put data in and get data out. And that's another cool thing about, so that we, this goes back to your earlier question about pre-trained. That's another cool thing about these models is all the, the really, um, crazy like computational work goes into training the models right and once you've got these models trained and that's where you're like updating weights and you're doing all this work and you're giving it tons and tons of data and getting tons of output and you're going back and based on the output you're going back and retraining the model and so on when you're done you end up kind of taking a snapshot of this thing and then freezing it in space and then you can deploy that out to hardware which is not really you know not really that that crazy and all you do is you just feed it input you've got all the all the um all the uh the weight saved and you just get the output you know and so that's one of the things that makes these pre-trained models so awesome is that after they're trained they're actually pretty lightweight and can be deployed out to uh hardware which is not that not that high powered and can work you know pretty well so Dave, i'm sure, I'm sure sylvie's I'm question oh i'm, so, I'm sorry I, I was just saying i'm no, sure forrest I, could correct a bunch of stuff I just said and actually expand no, on that, that a great deal. That's, that's no, basically I'll, how it is. And I'll touch on Sylvie's question as well in the context of that. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly how it is, Dave. Computer vision is a great example there because there's a very easy one-to-one -one mapping between the layers that you can see in it. Um, being a transformer-based model, GPT is definitely a deep neural network. I am not an AI engineer, so I can't speak to like, you know, the difference between a, uh, recurrent neural networks, transformers, LSTMs, all that different type of stuff. Um, what I can say is that, yeah, exactly like as Dave says there, um, computer vision is a fantastic example because you can model, um, you know, computer vision models is what's called a multi-layer perceptron, which is essentially like a very simple form of AI model where you have input layer, some number of hidden layers, an output layer. As Dave notes, the input layer might map to the RGB, to the initial like RGB values of all of the pixels in an image. So say you have like, you know, 500 by 500 um, you know, size image that you're trying to do some computer vision on, all 500 by 500 of those pixels would be, you know, hypothetically an input or a neuron in your input layer. So the computer thus is able to see the image by having all these initial neurons that tell it all of the, um, the initial, you know, RGB values. As it passes through the model, it might learn to detect, you know, say you're trying to build a model that detects humans versus cat faces. It might learn to detect as you, you know, do back propagation, you know, as Dave said, you, you show it something, you adjust the weights um, of all the neurons in the model as it gets close. And, uh, you know, through that process, we end up training it. You know, might be learning through those hidden layers to recognize, you know, the distinct edges that are associated with a certain type of face and then the distinct like sub features of a face that um, are, uh, are uh, what can tell it what type of face it is. The output layer is going to be, you know, just two neurons, cat or human, and that's going to be the entire output. So you have all these input layers, you know, whatever the math on 500 times 500 is, it's um, 250,000, I think. Yeah. So you have like 250,000 input neurons, you have all these hidden layer neurons, and then you just have two outputs potentially, right? So what kind of hardware do we use to do this? Well, we use normally the GPU, as we've expanded on quite a bit, there are now other things that are coming out to hopefully replace the GPU. Um, but we use the GPU in this because essentially all of the operations that go into doing these weights are incredibly simple mathematical operations. They are essentially a long series of multiply sum operations where you have some chain of numbers. They all get multiplied by something. They all get summed back together. Which means they're incredibly simple, very pipelineable mathematical operations. Because, you know, with computer vision, we're quite literally processing all the pixels on the screen in the same way. Um, and, you know, obviously with other cases, we're, you know, doing the same thing, these simple mathematical operations, but there's a very easy one-to-one -one mapping between like mapping pixels on a screen with a GPU and like seeing pixels in a computer vision model. The cores of a CPU 
are, you know, you probably only have 16 to 64 of those in most machines. They're highly complex, highly pipelined. They do a lot of different things other than just math. Um, CPU cores are incredibly complex, but ultimately you're only going to be churning away on, you know, essentially the number of neurons uh, as a number of cores that you have. So it's inefficient in the end to use CPUs for this type of training because you're essentially having these incredibly sophisticated cores doing these really, really basic multiply sum operations on whatever 16 to 64 cores you have. If you go to a GPU, you have thousands of cores available on it because it's meant to process thousands of little tiny pixel operations. So you can land all those neurons and that backpropagation and that training on these GPU cores that are much, much less individually complex than a given CPU core but are still complex enough to do really, really rapidly these little multiply sum operations that uh, are important for, G or for AI training. So we use GPUs ultimately because they have a really, really large amount of really, really small cores available that just do the exact amount of math um, that we need them to do. Um, and because there's thousands of them on any given GPU versus, you know, like I said, say 32 cores on a CPU that are going to be inefficiently used because they can do a lot more, a lot faster than just little multiply sum operations. Um, but that's all you're going to be using them for if you're trying to train on a CPU. And so this is why, um, you know, we have all these new chips coming out in AI is because GPUs are great for this and they were easily repurposed into AI training devices. But we're finding that, you know, the GPU is not the end all be all. We can actually build silicon that um, has way, way, way more of these little simple cores on it. And that can thus... Um, you know, replace the GPU and be more optimal there as a purpose-defined solution. Because all you need is just a bunch of little tiny execution units churning away at um, those really basic operations really fast. So that's ultimately why we do that. Stable Diffusion was trained on eight or uh, 32 um, eight times A100 boxes. So, uh, you know, 256 GPUs uh, is what it took to train Stable Diffusion. I can only imagine what it took to train ChatGPT because I, I think this is probably a more complex model. There's a lot more textual information, as we've noted, there's a lot more information you can, can encode as text in the end that it has to know and has to be able to make connections between. Um, and so ultimately, I, I can only really you know, theorize what the actual hardware this is run on. But I imagine if we look at stable diffusion and it taking 32 eight times A100 boxes, it was probably significantly more for chat GPT. There's one more question I want to jump to real quick. And then Forrest, I know you want to show us something, but uh, where to go? Mm -hmm. Uh, I know there's a lot of chat going on back and forth about who owns it, but there was one that was talking about how accurate it is. So James asked, how accurate is chat and GPT when it comes to writing code or code definition files? I think we've kind of covered that a little bit, but I, I want to go back to it real quick. I mean, from what I found, I mean, we're talking like 90, 85 to 90% there. I mean, and this to me is where it becomes important for having someone who really knows what they're doing, look at it to get it that last 15, 10% of the way there. Um, that's what I found, and I assume that's probably similar for everybody else, which kind of goes to it, it may be difficult to say it's going to replace someone's job because somebody's still going to have to look at all of this and make sure that it's right. I would definitely not use it to do something like, you know, uh, do the final steps of an analysis for a paper and, you know, give me the P values as to whether or not my hypothesis is correct. That would be a really bad use of this, you know, unless you went back and you actually did the math and looked at the statistics and made sure that they did it properly. Um, that kind of thing would be a very, very bad use. To me, the best use right now is like, you know, I could spend half a day, you know, I, I need to ingest, I need to like ingest, I don't even know. I've got a bunch of data that's like movies of something and I need to um, pull them all in as frames and then you break them down into some color space. And I could spend half a day looking up a way to do all that stuff and do it. Or I could just ask you to do it. Can you just do it for me? Because then if you if you give it something like that, you, it's very, very easy to test. Right. Then you, you got a movie, you give it to it and you look you look through and you look through if it actually broke it down into individual frames and if it actually, you know, put it in the color space that you wanted it to be. Um, so that's the kind of stuff, stuff that you can easily check stuff. That's just like kind of bookkeeping, boring kinds of code to write yourself that you can, it's, you're not too worried about whether or not it's going to be right or wrong because you can easily check it to see if it's right or wrong, but it's just going to, you know, maybe you're rusty in the language you're working in or whatever. And it's just going to take you a little while to, to go through and figure it out. That's the kind of stuff I would use it for right now. Not stuff that you're like, Oh, okay, great. I'm not going to go back and check this chat. GPT says it's correct. Let's submit this paper to nature. 
probably a bad idea. <laughs> Thank you. I want to be right, Forrest. I, yeah, I'm, we'll jump to that in a second. I one final thought. Yep. I want to be leery about the verification thing. It's easy to have a whole team of people working on something, and then all of a sudden, when you have something that's you know got all the skill of all these programmers built into it, to suddenly not need all those people and just need a couple of them to verify things. I saw this metaphorically elsewhere in a couple of um, places recently with advancing technology where there was, you know, once eight people to verify something, but now there's just one person because of where the tech has come out of. As I, you know, just, just this week, you know, very relevant to this, like I said, I saw, I won't expand upon, but an example of where there was once, you know, four to eight people at a spot to verify, you know, certain credentials, but now there's just one person and there's like an automatic electronic gate basically. So the final thought that I would have about like the replacement of jobs and stuff like that is it's you, there is a lot of verification has to be done with it. Somebody does still have to look at it. Um, but you can still end up doing a lot of um, harm in the end with automation uh, because the lift at that point is, you know, you just need, <laughs> I think I said the best guy, but somebody told me it'd probably end up being the cheapest at most places. <laughs> um, it will be. But yeah, so we do have to be careful there. It's incredibly powerful technology. We don't really know. You know this is just a research preview. We don't really know what this is going to do once people can retrain this on their own data sets and all that type of thing. We're already seeing um, what I view to be negative effects of the text to image stuff out there. So it's just important that you know all of us remember that this is very new ground for all of us. And you know this is really something that's only come out in like the last couple of months. So you know, watch out, look out for your fellow humans, and. Uh, <laughs> where it's just a machine. So. All right, show us something. So really quickly, um, if, we can, if we can add that other board up here, we have uh, ChatGPT joining us here today. So we have a question that's come in from the chat, um, the public one about a certain said command randomly. I think this was in the context of looking at um, uh, regular expressions and things like that. So just live, we're just going to see what happens when we run this. Um, it might completely blow up. It might um, it, it might work. Uh, we'll see what it does. I, I have confidence we're not going to get anything that's uh, going to be too terrible. So we uh, ended the future. <laughs> too terrible. It looks pretty benign. If it uh, is going to work at all or if it's severely under load at the moment. Oh, here we go. Zoom in a little bit. So, like I said, I always thought this... that if I had a couple. Sorry, I was just going to fill some time and say I always thought if I had a couple of dogs, I would name one Sid and the other one Auk. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see that we're getting quite a bit of output here. You know, the I flag tells Sid to edit the file in place. The E flag tells it to use regular expressions, and we can see the regular expression itself is quite complex, but it can be broken down into several parts. And so you can see it, as Dave mentioned earlier, with analyzing regular expressions, it just tells us straight up, this is a flag that tells said to ignore case. You know, this means that it will match Dave. So it's looking forward and figuring out what text it's actually going to be parsing out of this regular expression. And then here at the end, we get this, the said command will search for strings that match the entire regular expression or replace them with a modified version of the string. In this case, you know, da 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 da. And so it even gives us, you know, an example of what that regex is going to do. Um, if you're not familiar with regular expressions, you may want to consult a reference or tutorial to learn more about them. So um, our entire book's written on it. Thanks. Thanks All a right. lot. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of funny, you know, just kind of a, a real world example of what this looks like. Um, if we had another, and we have a comment from the comment saying it's not correct syntactically and, uh, Maybe there's something incorrect about that, but, but yeah, so this is, you know, this is perhaps an example of the Dunning-Kruger, you know, machine here. This is perhaps an example of um, artificial intelligence genuinely, um, but uh, I'll let your expert, what's up? Can you ask it who owns uh, the copyright of the content that's generated? That was one of the questions we had come in and I'd, I'd be very curious to get it, get its opinion. I saw that Dave did this. So I'll be curious to see if we get the same thing twice. 
Does that capture the essence of your question, Justin? Yeah, go for it. Okay, who owns the copyright of the content generated during this research preview of ChatGPT? It'll either say it doesn't know what ChatGPT is, or it's gonna give us an actual answer. Cause it, it see sometimes, it's interesting cause sometimes it knows about itself. So when I asked it, I said, who owns the copyright of content generated by ChatGPT? Chat and it said the content is owned or that's generated by the machine learning model including chat GPT belongs to the creator of the content. And in most cases, that's the person who trained the model. So very interesting to see it's uh, the, the BS artist at work. <laughs> it definitely has a varying response to things. We talk about, um, you know, jobs might create prompt engineer is a perfectly legitimate way of looking at this because just yeah. as it takes an expert to uh, query or no, sorry, just as it takes an expert to analyze these results for accuracy, it sometimes takes an expert to query this. I was trying to get it to build, um, like some bioinformatics code, but I found that my prompt was a little bit incorrect from the start, like in kind of the assumption of what one piece of software was going to do. So when I took this code to a couple of the bioscience people like Dave and um, another person CIQ, Glenn, like, well, you know, you don't quite use this tool for that type of thing. So it's odd that it, um, even though this was an incorrect thing to ask it for, it just gave you this, oh, here's how you do it with that. Um, so there's definitely a lot of variability. And I, I'd like to point out, too, that this is an excellent example of what I was talking about earlier. So that we have two different questions here, the first of which I would say if you needed that regular expression to work after you asked it, you know, everything that you needed to know about the regular expression, the next thing to do is to go to your terminal and test that regular expression in as many different like corner cases as you can come up with. And if it checks out, you should be happy with the regular expression that was generated. The second question is, is obviously one that you can't just, I mean, unless you want to just like make a bunch of, you know, stake your claim about some copyright and go to court over it. I mean, that would be the, the, the real way in which to test that. Probably you don't want to do that. So there's a good example of good questions and bad questions for the, the uh, chat bot at yeah. this point. <laughs> Looks like we may force. Ask real quick to create a container definition for something simple. Okay. I just want to point out really quickly. There was a little bit more that we missed there. So it does say if you're the human author of the content generated by chat, GPT trans research preview, you're the owner of the copyright. You have exclusive, you know, blah, 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 blah. Publicly data. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So kind of interesting. Just wanted to show it did give us a full response out there. Uh, that was a little bit more complex. It kind of touches on a couple of things. Um, I know uh, really quickly, Zane, what did you say? Build a container definition? Just, for a, just a simple container container definition for something. And it's interesting. Mine ended. Mine was much shorter answer about the uh, copyright law. It ended it saying uh, you should probably consult a lawyer, which is uh, probably a great way to caveat its response. GPU enabled copyright. What am I thinking? For GPU enabled or NVIDIA GPU enabled PyTorch inside of it. Cool. Well, glad you chose a simple one. Well, I can do it. I mean, it, it gave me like, oh. Uh, uh, we, we to log out and log back in. Oh, I Ooh. think we might have. I think we might have. We might have nuked it. Hit the end. No. Oh. Give me just log out and back in real quick. It'll fix yeah, can it. Can you uh, take it off, off really quickly? Cool, thank you. Just one second. I do. That is happening. You would get halfway through writing something and it would network error out. And I'd have to go back and do it again. That happened in, several times. In the meantime, while we're, while we're waiting for that, like my experience so far has been like like we've been talking about. It answers very confidently and very positively, and much to very similar to it generating the same Golang code that I tried to generate kind of assumptively, but it was wrong. I just asked it, what does this bit of Python do with a, an, a Python 2 style hello world, but running it with the Python 3 interpreter? And it's like, oh, it prints hello world. But of course, that's incorrect because Python 3 changed the syntax for that. So it doesn't know when things are going to go wrong. It can't evaluate the correctness of it. It just puts something up there that looks right. I think we can just take it down one more time really quickly. For some reason, logging out and logging back in didn't work. So give me just one second, everyone. Did you guys happen I'm, to I'm see trying to, I'm trying the same thing on my end, and I'm getting the same thing. So it, no, it, it's, it's, did you, it might have broken the internet. Of that, did you guys see how fast this thing got adopted to, or got to a million users? So Dolly took two months to get to a million users. G, ChatGPT took five days. 
just pretty That's astounding. Great. And and every every time I'm on it, uh, running something, I inevitably within some session I'm doing, it'll it'll basically say it's overloaded. So lots of people are uh, quite interested in this. It looks like I uh, even on like a fresh clear history and reinstall it um, or relog in. It's it's telling me that their servers are overloaded. So we have um, the container definition file that would have been very impressive to see, and we have another regex here in the output or in a. They probably know, have us to thank for that, right? In this webinar, we have <laughs> probably we increased their popularity <laughs> so much that we've, we've finally yeah. <laughs> here to help. Well, we are kind of up on the end of time anyway, so I appreciate it. Uh, I'm not going to say that there will be a blog about this, but it might be interesting if uh, Forrest, if you would go write something up real quick and and kind of do the definition or the container definition, and throw it out there what it what it generates, just so people can see, so we can follow up. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you guys for joining us this week. It's an exciting topic. I know we could probably just keep talking about this the rest of the day and kill a bunch of time because it's super interesting. But we appreciate you guys joining. Thank you for all the interaction. If you would go like and subscribe if you enjoyed this, and we will see you uh, probably after the holidays. I don't think we're doing one the next two weeks, so. We appreciate it and thank you for joining us.